We're moving out on another episode of Military Collectors. This week we're going clear across the country to Ogden, Utah. We're going to be talking machine guns. No, not this one, but John M. Browning and the inventions that he made to successfully win this country its world wars. This and a whole lot more this week on Military Collectors. Roger that. Welcome to Military Collectors this week. Doing a little PMCS on the fleet, and I've added a vehicle, okay? An M151A2, it is a 1970. It is number 19 off the assembly line. And what I'm really excited about is it came with a replica M60 machine gun, just like you see here. All of these things are original with the exception of the receiver, but it looks just like it did when it came out of the arms room back during my heyday, as well as the mainstay M60 machine gun of the Vietnam era. Well, as we're gonna be talking about machine guns today, we're gonna to head on out to Ogden, Utah, and we're gonna go look at the guy that invented what's many considered to be the modern day machine guns and the concept, John M. Browning. And I've got a great subject matter expert out there, Scott Grange, is gonna go behind the scenes at the John M. Browning Museum, and we're gonna talk machine guns all day, all the time, on military collectors. Here in the John M. Browning workshop is joining me this week Scott Grange is with Public Relations with Browning. We're going to talk about the Browning legacy of firearms right here in this little shop. Scott, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. You know, it really started right here. It did, Bob. You know, we get asked all the time, why is the Browning Museum in Ogden, Utah? Well, that's because the, this is where it all began. John M. Browning was born in Ogden, Utah. His, his parents migrated here with the pioneers, the Mormon pioneers, so he was born here. And that's why corporate headquarters is located just up the street in Morgan County. Well, you know, a little bit of the history behind John and all of his guns, of course, you know, uh, for military collectors, they have to have certain ones of these, and we're gonna see them here on our show this week. But give us just a little bit of the start and, and where we went. Well, you know, uh, his first design was actually a, a single shot falling block action rifle. And from there, things just blossomed. He developed a relationship with Winchester Repeating Arms in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, that lasted about 19 years uh, through the uh, early 18, mid 1800s to late 1800s. Um, and then he got interested in, in automatic systems. And the way that happened was, as he was observed the grass moving one day as the guys were shooting at the rifle range and he thought I can capture that gas and make it function the action and so he did and he made the first automatic rifle built on an old 1873 lever action system it's called the flapper we have one here we'll show the folks that was the first automatic rifle and from there it was just boom 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 he had designs in his head he, he probably got very little sleep at night because he was thinking about these designs and he was always one step ahead of those who needed those designs because as they needed them, he would say, yep, I have that one. It's, it's uh, all but perfected. We'll have it in a couple of months. Well, not only is his genius in the military once, but of course into the sporting firearms that Browning sells today, but, but again, to the layman person out here or somebody just seeing our show, th this is a primitive workshop. Oh, it is. It really is, but but this is what he used to create them. That's right, and when T.G. Bennett came from Winchester to visit the Browning Brothers in Ogden, Utah territory, it wasn't even a state back then, he was amazed at what he saw. Here's this little shop out here in Utah, these youngsters, as he called them, uh, running the show. John M. was a very young man in his, in his late 20s. Uh, it, it's amazing what they were able to do here, but he had heard of, of the Browning designs clear back in New Haven, and he thought, I need to get out there and see what's going on. So they struck up a relationship that lasted almost 20 years. Our featured email this week comes from Alex Randall from Chicago, Illinois. Bob, I'm an avid collector of military vehicles, but my favorite is my M274 mechanical mule. Can you tell me the backstory on the development of the mule and how many of them were actually produced? 
Alex, the U.S. military M274 truck. Platform, utility, one-half ton, 4x4, or carrier, light weapons, infantry, aka mule, is a four-wheel drive gasoline-powered truck tractor-type vehicle that can carry up to a half ton off-road. They were used as platforms for various weapon systems and for carrying men, supplies, and weaponry ammunition during the Vietnam War and in other U.S. military operations until the 1980s. There were 11,240 mules produced between their introduction and 1970 and is now a rare military vehicle collector's item. If you'd like to have your military restoration project or collectible featured on the show, just send an email with your photos to photos at militarycollectorstv.com. Welcome back to Military Collectors. Again, this week it's all about machine guns. You know, and I've got a great replica s specimen right here, but you know, going behind the scenes at any museum is really kind of a special treat. And so Ogden, Utah is home of the Browning Museum. John M. Browning, his shop, all of the machine guns to include the first one that he ever made is right there and we had the chance to go right behind the displays behind the glass if you will and take a look at the very first machine gun that john m browning put into action in world war one scott grange my subject matter expert he is with browning out in morgan utah nobody better can tell you about john m browning its history and the machine guns that john invented we are here at the John Browning Museum. We are in a location here inside the museum, behind the glass, at a location that nobody ever gets to come into. And John Browning developed the first automatic weapons for military use for the wars that started with World War I. And Scott, you know, actually, before that, this one was developed way earlier than that. It was, Bob. You know, uh, up until this, the only significant system out there was the Gatling gun. And John M. Browning knew that there was going to be a need for a gas-operated machine gun. And he developed what they called the flapper gun, which was uh, nothing more than an 1873 lever-action rifle that utilized the gases of uh, exiting the muzzle to operate the action. And from that evolved the first automatic machine gun. And this is a crude prototype sample of that gun. Well, Scott, listen, I mean, as important this one was, what came next? Well, uh, just like any prototype, you, uh, further development takes place. And thus, this system here was the next animal in that development program. Goodness. Okay, it's a little crude looking, but it worked very, very well. But it overheated real quick. And so the development continued to take place to the point where John M. was very satisfied with the 30 caliber uh, automatic machine gun, which was called the Colt 1895, because Colt is the one who produced it. Well, Scott, I have to ask you now, we, we see 30 caliber as kind of that, that range of bullet. Was that a government spec, or is that just something that he was comfortable with making? Well, both. Both. That, that, the government always dictated what they needed, and he operated on those premises, okay? And so, yes, he developed those systems with that in mind. And, and, and the fact that he ultimately came up with the, the automatic machine gun that would handle the 3040 Craig was a tremendous development. Okay, Scott, the, the gases on the last one got hot. So now, tell us about number three. Well, if you know anything about firing cartridges really fast, you know that things heat up in a hurry. And so the need for a water-cooled system was there, and so he developed the water-cooled 30 caliber machine gun, which was where they, they would hold a, have a container next to them with a, a hose that ran to it and, and would cool the, cool the barrel down. The, this system, the 1895, was used in a lot of campaigns around, around the world, and, 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 and the water cool was just the next step in that evolution, which really, really improved things because now they could shoot tremendous bursts for long periods of time and not do damage to the firearm. All in 30 caliber. Exactly. Wow. Okay, Scott, now we're in World War I. 
Now this one. Well, leading up to World War I, uh, the, the Colt 1895 had done an admirable job through those campaigns. You know, all around the world it was used. Um, as we entered into World War I, John M. knew that we would be dragged into that war. Even though he tried to sell an updated version of the 30 water-cooled machine gun, to the government. They said, hey, that's a really cool system, we love it, but yeah, okay, we'll let you know. It kind of frustrated him, and he made the comment to his brothers, there will come a day that the government comes to us and says, guys, we need an automatic machine gun better than what we had, and we need it now. Well, Bob, if you know anything about government regulations, and whatnot, they're no different back then than they are today. Absolutely. It's miles of red tape and months of this and months of, it, it, it was horrible. Well. They said they had so much faith in John M. They said, John, just do it and we'll accept it. Okay? Wow. So he, here's, here's the gun, here's the automatic machine gun that led us into World War I in 1917. Oh, and by the way, he had another little system in the back of his mind that we call today the BAR. He had all that developed in his mind before he even built the first prototype. He, he knew that the government would need a gun that the trench shoulder, soldier could carry and be effective with. Stay tuned. When we come back, right here on Military Collectors, we're going to be talking about two of the more modern versions of John M. Browning's machine gun inventions, the 30 caliber and the M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun. Welcome back to the show. You know that little system that John M. Browning had in the back of his mind that Scott talked about previously? Well, this is it. The BAR. Scott, I tell you, this... And you know, it took a pretty good soldier to, to hump this thing. It did, Bob, but it was half the weight, exactly half the weight of the next closest system out there. And so, yes, it, it was heavy, but a, but, but a good-sized man could carry that rifle into the field. And, and be so effective that it was, it, there wasn't anything out there that was even close to it. Well, being an infantry guy that I am, I, this thing probably is about the same weight as what soldiers today would term the, the um, M60 roughly, machine gun. It, it, it's it's uh, 32 pounds. Yeah, roughly. exactly. Yeah, it'll empty a, a 20 round magazine in about two and a half seconds. Wow. And, and you can imagine a handheld firearm before that couldn't, couldn't do anything even close to it. So you talk about, it'd be like having an AR-15 at the Little Bighorn today. There you go. The BAR, the Browning Automatic Rifle. Okay, well, we've got more behind the scenes yes, stuff, we do. okay? And yes, we do. As we walk gingerly back here behind the glass, let's go look at the next one. Okay. All right. Okay, Scott, we're now here, the last of the big machine guns, uh, the Ma Deuce. Tell us about a little about the history behind this one, because think you have a unique story on this one. Well, uh, you know, kind of like leading up to World War I, uh, the government was in need of, of specific systems to be effective. Well, as, as time changes and improves and everybody comes up with those great systems, there's a need for a better system. Well, the, the, the government was in need of something that was heavy duty, uh, extremely uh, rugged, air-cooled, uh, would shoot a 50 caliber, slug, okay, thus have you have the, the M2 Magus is what it's called, uh, Browning 50 caliber BMG. Well, you know, this gun to me has special memories because as a brand new infantry second lieutenant in my first unit, my platoon sergeant, the first thing out of the hat box I had to do was to set the headspace and timing on this thing, okay, and out there in the little box that he always kept was an ammo can. Uh, not only did we have the headspace and time and wrench, but there was also a can of motor oil. And I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing with the motor oil? He said, I'll show you. And of course, the, for lubrication and those sorts of things, right. all the parts. And you know as well as anybody, Bob, by playing with these systems, um, one thing about Browning designs is they are always simple. Yes. Very simple to disassemble, reassemble, in, 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 the, in the matter of seconds, in, in some cases, uh, blindfolded in some cases, okay? These systems, he always worked uh, on a simple, simple system. Simpler the better. Well, as a young man, to develop all of these, he was a genius. He was. He, he was ahead really of his time. And with that, 
I think there's one final thing, and I want to just make sure that all of our viewers out there have this thought in mind that, again, you and I wouldn't be standing here if it was not for him. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and I have to say, Bob, the, the fact that you and I are here today speaking English and not German is because of these designs. Uh, there was once a German uh, commander that made the statement that if we had had the Browning 50 BMG machine gun, the Battle of Britain would have turned out differently. On our previous segments of Military Collectors, we've kind of taken you through the chronology and the history of John M. Browning's inventions of the machine gun. Scott Grange has laid that out very, very well. And now I want to talk and bring on a special guest, Colonel Retired Bill Hansen, who actually put the M2 50 caliber into action in combat in Vietnam. Let's listen to a little bit of Bill's story about the M2 and its effectiveness in combat during Vietnam. With me as a special guest, Bill Hansen, a retired colonel, who I want to hear his story, and I know you want to hear it as well, about his experience with the M2, the heavy browning machine gun, 50 caliber. Bill, it's an honor and a privilege. Thank you for your service to our country. But tell me your personal experience, a little bit about the history, about how you even came to get in the military. I think that's a unique story as well. Uh, my father had been a tanker in World War II and he fired expert with every weapon to include the Model 2, Modus, heavy barrel machine gun. And uh, I enlisted in the Army right out of high school and uh, went through basic training, which at that time was the M1, and went to Fort Knox as a cavalry scout and was introduced to the automatic weapon systems. The 30 caliber that you and Scott have talked about and the uh, 50 caliber because I was a cavalry scout, went through all the nomenclature, I can still peel it off to you, 26 pound barrel, 56 pound receiver, crew served weapon with three on the ground, but mounted on a combat vehicle like a tank or an APC. It's a wonderful, wonderful gun. I went through OCS, was commissioned. Uh, a couple of years later, was sent to Vietnam as a young captain and uh, been given a command of a wonderful troop, uh, Charlie Troop of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment in 68 and 69 and experienced uh, many times to, uh, to employ this weapon in combat. I have, that's when my love affair really started with it. And uh, being from Utah, I used the terminology and told my troops, I said, with the headspace and timing gauge and the right maintenance, we can make that weapon sing like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> and, uh, and we've done that. Uh, I, I remained in the Army for uh, another 20 plus years and went through the requirements process and as a user and watched this weapon survive against all the technology that came about. Today we see it mounted on the best tank in the world, the M1A2 SEP tank, has a 50 caliber machine gun up in the commander's cupola. It's on artillery pieces. It, uh, it just uh, speaks to the brilliance and the uh, foresight and inspiration of the Browning family on the development of that weapon system. Well, you know, Bill, one final thing that I wanted just uh, to hear from you is, is really uh, you're involved after you've retired now into a special foundation. Tell us a little bit about that because I think that's, that's really worthy and, and again, supporting our troops uh, current day is, is really a great thing. Thanks for asking. The, uh, <clears throat> the foundation is Warriors of Field Legacy Foundation. As you know, when many of us returned from Vietnam, we were not treated very well. In fact, I think we were vilified. And uh, I think those of us of the Vietnam generation made a collective informal pact that we were not going to let that kind of treatment uh, carry on into, into further serving men, women in uniform, and especially those in combat. And when 9-11 came about, uh, I was in a position to where uh, I had a number of friends, uh, retired senior officers and others, and we got together and said, we're going to form a foundation through hunting and fishing, with firearms, the outdoors, we can help these kids that are returning, those that have been wounded, banged up, and some of those that have just had the combat experience and are looking for someone who understands them. And that's where the legacy comes in. We, the Vietnam generation, have our hands on the back of this OIF, OEF generation. There will be more wars. We're seeing it coming. We're getting longer in tooth as Vietnam veterans. I want to see this generation replace us and take care of future generations of soldiers, sailors, airmen, 
Coast Guard people. Bill, Godspeed for all you've done for our country and what you'll do for those that follow behind all of us. Thank you so much for being a guest on our show today. Thank you for asking. For more information about Warriors of Field Legacy Foundation, log on to their website at warriorsoffield.org. Well, that's all of Military Collectors this week. I really have to thank my special guest, Scott Grange from Browning and Bill Hansen. Those two gentlemen really laid out John M. Browning's and the use of that gun in combat. And I'll tell you what, this was the gun of my era during Vietnam, well up into the 90s when I was on active duty. And so again, Military Collectors is all about you and it's about the people behind these wonderful collections of military history. Again, we're going to be moving on out next week to another great episode. Stay tuned because I tell you what, right back here, Military Collectors will be coming your way. <music>